before you walk. Zeke, why don't you open us in prayer this evening? All right, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for today. Dear Lord, thank you for the many blessings you've given us at this church. Lord, I pray that we are on your service tonight, Lord, and that we are here something that you have to tell us tonight, Lord. In your name, pray. Amen. 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 So let's stand together as we sing our chorus. What's impossible for God? Nothing. Nothing is impossible. So let's sing it with all your hearts, especially during this Christmas time. It still is more true than ever. Man, we're really lopsided tonight, aren't we? Uh, we can sit over there. Well, when, when I sit down over here, it will balance things out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's sing our song. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to me. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word for everything, oh everything, yes everything is possible with God. Anybody have a testimony to share? Um, even in the past of something God has done you thought was impossible. Round 
not our expert, but Johnny Paddock, who wrote the conception of prayer. Lord Father, thank you. Thank you for letting us be here tonight. Lord Father, please be with all those families that have whatever prayer is on their minds. Lord, some people keep their prayers as an unspoken request, but you know exactly what they are. Lord, you are the great physician. You can do everything. You can bring your son back to you. One nation under God, if you will, it's your will, Lord. But Lord, please heal all the people that we're praying for. You're very faithful to answer our prayers and to move those people up to you in prayer. We feel confident and have faith that you're going to take care of us as your will pleases. Lord, Father, be with us tonight while we really go through a blessing with Brother Jonathan and hope we all understand it and get a good meaning out of it. Like I told Pastor Jonathan, Romans is one of the hardest books in the Bible for me to understand, and I'm getting a little bit better grasp on it. So I hope it's a good blessing for everybody and that everybody gets something out of it. And please be with us as we go along and come back to the next point in time. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you had your Bibles open to Romans 6? Raise your hands. Good, you can change them. <laughs> John's Gospel, chapter number one tonight. John's Gospel, chapter number one. With us not having church next Wednesday night and moving it to next Friday night for Christmas Eve, I felt like that if we started in Romans 6 tonight, when we got back to Romans chapter number 6, we'd all be lost. So I want to, because I plan on the Friday, on Christmas Eve, going over the Christmas story and sharing a few thoughts on that. And tonight I want to go to John's Gospel, chapter number 1. John's Gospel, chapter number 1 tonight. And uh, give you what the Lord has given me. And if I could have preached Sunday, this is probably what I would have preached on. And uh, I felt like <clears throat> I should share it tonight. A lot of people, a lot of people, when they look at Jesus, a lot of people's concept of Him is what's the word I want to use? I want to be nice when I say this, but I don't want to corrupt. I mean, I'll just be plain and simple. Some people never get past him being a babe in a manger. Some people never get him past, past him being crucified. And they forget that all that he is. And as I sit down and study John's Gospel, chapter number 1, there's a lot that John says about who Jesus is and what Jesus is. And as we go into this Christmas season, I want us to step back and think about him being more than a babe in a manger and more than a man that died on a cross, but because he's deeper than that. Who is he to you personally every day that you live? And I believe we can get that tonight out of John's Gospel, chapter number 1. So when you find your place in John 1, say amen. amen. Again, reading verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the, and the darkness, notice this church, comprehended it not. Now if we put that in today's terms, and the light shineth in darkness. What is the light? That light is Christ. What is that light? That light is the gospel. What is darkness? That is this world. That, are, that is those who are lost and undone without Christ. And the Bible says, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now every man that hears the gospel will be saved by the grace of God. With that being said tonight, I want to teach tonight, and I'm going to do my best to be as brief as possible, but I want to teach tonight on the divine life of Christ. The divine life of Christ. When we look over and through the Gospels, each Gospel depicts Christ as something else. Matthew emphasized him as the king. If you wanted to pinpoint, the book of Matthew was written to the Jews, okay? 
Then we get to Mark. Mark presented him as a servant ministering to needy people. And some writers and scholars believe that Mark was written to the Romans. Luke was uh, Luke wrote the gospel for the Greeks and introduced them to the Son of Man. But then we get to John. John, the beloved disciple, wrote a book, or wrote a gospel for both the Jews and the Gentiles, presenting Jesus as the Son of God. And he didn't write it just to the Jews or just to the Gentiles, but he wrote the book of John for the entire world. And I'm glad tonight that Christ can be represented to the Jews. I'm glad that Christ can be represented to the Romans. I'm glad that Christ can be represented to the Greeks. But I'm also glad that Christ can be re represented to the entire world. Christ isn't, just saw, Christ isn't just dedicated to the Baptist or to the Methodist or to the Lutherans or to the Presbyterians or to the Catholics. But Christ died for all men. Christ come to save every man. Am I right tonight, church? Amen. Christ come to be a personal Lord and Savior to everyone that would accept him. So tonight as we look at the life of Christ, there's a few things tonight throughout the book of John that I want to give you. Number one tonight, I want us to look as Christ. He is the Word. He is the Word. Preacher, how do you get that? Go with me to verse number one and two. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. Verse number 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Preacher, what do you see about him being the Word? Number one tonight, I see him being the eternal Word. He existed in the beginning, not because he had a beginning as a creature, but because he is eternal. We went over to John's Gospel, chapter number 8, and I think it's verse number 58. Jesus made the statement, before Abraham was, I am. In the beginning was the Word. When you think about the Word being God, the Word that spoke this world into existence, the Word that formed Adam and breathed life into his nostrils uh, and created him out of dust. Uh, the same God took that word and he created Eve uh, out of a rib of Adam. And then we created, and, and within, he took animals uh, and, he and he created them. Then he put the stars, and I got it in order, but you get in the concept of where we're going, spoke stars into existence, uh, put planets uh, into existence, uh, and in the middle of all of that uh, has the time to sit on his throne in heaven and have the word of comfort, uh, the word of strength, uh, the word of knowledge that you and I need every day. He's the eternal word, the word that will never fail. A word that will never lie to you. A word that will never destroy you. But a word that is always there to help and encourage you. When you think about him being the eternal word, not only do you see that tonight, but then we get down to verse number three tonight. And I've already dealt with this, so I got a little bit ahead of myself. The Bible says, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. We see him this evening only as the eternal word. But we see him secondly this evening as the creative word. There's a parallel between John 1.1 and Genesis 1.1. The parallel is, if you went back to John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, excuse me, and the word was with God. Genesis chapter number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Does that make sense this evening? The great parallel. Every reference when we talk about Jesus, when you study throughout the Bible, always goes back to the Old Testament to help you understand what is taking place in the New Testament. That's why, and I said this the other Wednesday night, and I'll say it again, that's why I have a problem with people who says the Old Testament is not relevant to us today. It is relevant. You have to have the Old Testament to be able to understand what's taking place in the New Testament. Right. Amen. Amen. Moving on this evening, 
We know that God created all things according to Colossians 1.16. He's the eternal God. When we think about that this evening, creation is finished. It is not a process still going on, even though God certainly is at work in his creation. When you think about that, creation is not a process, but it is a finished product. When you think about that, the world is completely done. But God is still working throughout the world. Y'all with me this evening? Amen. It's like the construction of this church is completed, is it not? But the work doesn't stop inside, does it? It's just like God. God's done working with the world. Or making the world, but he's still working inside of the world to keep everything going forward, the created world. Then this evening, when I think about that, I want us to go down to John's Gospel, chapter number 1 and verse number 14. John's Gospel, chapter number 1, verse number 14. When you find your place there, say amen. amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Think about that. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as only the begotten of the Father. Notice this. Full of what, church? Grace and what? Truth. When we think about that, not only do we see him as the eternal word, the creative word, but tonight we see him as the incarnate word. When we think about that, he was not a phantom or a spirit when he ministered on earth. Nor was his body a mere illusion. John and other disciples had a personal experience that convinced them of the reality of the body of Christ. Even Thomas said, Lord, if that's really you, let me put my finger in your, or let me put my hand in your side, right? And let me touch the nail prints in your hand. He had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. Tonight, we may not have seen him in his earthly form, but tonight, through the eyes of faith, we can witness what he has done in our hearts and in our lives. In the gospel, John points out that Jesus, talking about him being the incarnate, in, John, in the gospel of John 4 and verse number 6, he points out with the story of the woman at the well that Jesus was weary. That's why he sat down. That was the human side. He was thirsty because he asked the woman, he said, give me to drink. Am I right? When you think about that, in John's gospel chapter number 11, he groaned within. In John eleven thirty five, he wept at the death of Lazarus. On the cross, he thirsted in John 19, 28. In John 19, 30, he gave up the ghost and died. In John 19.34, he bled after his resurrection. In John's Gospel, chapter number 20, uh, 24 through 29, he proved that he still had a real body. Now think about that. He said, I've done all of this as a human would do, but yet I still am God. Y'all with me this evening? When you think about that, there was a song that used to be sung. He was so much man that he slept in a boat, but he was so much God that the wind ceased when he spoke. He was so much man, he wept when Lazarus died, yet he was so much God, Lazarus came forth when he cried. When you think about how God truly is, how could you deny and say he is not the word tonight? Secondly, not only do we see him as the word. Is everybody good on the word part? You are saved, man. Amen. Did everybody get the verses that I called out, or did I go too fast? Y'all good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now tonight, I know we see him as the word, but second of all tonight, what else do we see him as? I see him as the light. He is the light. When you think about him being the light, preacher, how do you get that? Go with me to John's Gospel, chapter number 1, verse number 4. In him was light. And the light was what? The light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. When we think about life and light, the life is a key here in John's gospel. It is used 36 times. What is the essential for human life? 
is what, church? Light. You think about if you sit in darkness all the time, how would you feel? Miserable, right? When you think about light, there are at least four different types of light. If the sun went out, everything would die. Your grass would die, right? Your trees would die. Your crops would die. Your beautiful flowers outside of your house would die. You think about all of that. Your air, your water, your food, all of that has to have light in order to survive. And when you think about that, God is all of those to us that is Christ. When, we have, when we're going through the storms of life, he is that light at the end of the tunnel because we know through him we're going to make it through. So when we think about him being the light tonight, what are some few things? Number one, he's the light of the world. When you think about that, preacher, how do you get that? If we went over to John's Gospel, chapter number 8, I don't have time to chase all of these, so you'll have to study some of this for yourself, all right? In John's Gospel, chapter number 8, Tonight, we would see him as the son of righteousness. By the Holy Spirit, in John's Gospel, chapter number 3, and John's Gospel, chapter number 20, we see that he gives us the breath of life through the Holy Spirit. When we think about God tonight, we think about him as a trinity. You know, with me? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, right? What is the Holy Spirit? He is that light inside of us, right? That leads us and guides us through a dark and miserable world. When we think about that, not only do we see him as the breath of life, but then in John's Gospel, chapter number 4, and verse number 10, we see him as the water of life. He said, I will give you of that water that you may never thirst again. Is that what he told the woman at the well? He said, you will never thirst again. When you think about him being that water, in other words, he is the satisfying light. We don't have to look to the world, world for our joy. We don't have to look to the world for our peace. We don't have to look for the world for kindness. We get all of that from God. When we think about that, then we see him in John's Gospel, chapter number 6, that he is the living bread of life that came down from heaven. But we know this evening that he not only has life, but he gives life. He said, I come that you might have life and have it, our church, more abundantly. In other words, that life that he gives isn't just for today. It isn't just for tomorrow, but it's for all of eternity. Amen. Moving on. Not only is he light of life and the light of the world, but then when we look here at the light, we see that light and darkness is a recurring theme here in the Gospel of John. We know that God is light, while Satan is the power of darkness. When we go over to John's Gospel, chapter number 3, and I think it's verse number 19, the Bible says, and I may be wrong about that, that don't seem right. I may have mistyped that. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than light. Why, church? Because their deeds are evil. Have you ever noticed you go into a place that's not, and I'm not being, so don't judge me on this, okay? But you go to a place where wickedness is, and it's always dark. Why? Because deeds are evil. Nothing, Mama used to tell me as a kid, nothing good happens after dark. Well, that ain't necessarily true. But I'll tell you when I got in a lot of trouble, it was after dark. <laughs> Last night I was on the phone with my dad and we was having a conversation and uh, and my dad was talking about something that happened yesterday and I was giving him a hard time about it and he said, yeah, I bet if truth was told, you've done something similar. And I said, well, daddy, I got a confession to make. He said, what? I said, I did something worse. And he said, what'd you do? And I went on to tell him about a story. Now, don't do this at home, kids, all right? I went and told him a story about the time I outrun the law on my way home. He said, if I'd have known that, I said, I know. That's why you're finding it out now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I've not told that. 
When you think about that, when did it happen? In the darkness. Why did it happen in the darkness? Because I was somewhere where I shouldn't have been, and I had to get home because I was running late on my curfew that mom and daddy had set in place, and I was doing 70 and a 35, and I passed the state trooper. I seen them turn around, and I shot up the side road, cut off my car, cut off my headlights, cut off everything, seen the blue lights go this way, seen the blue lights go this way, seen them go this way, and seen them go this way again, and it was more than one cop car. And I turned around and pulled out behind them and drove home very carefully. <laughs> you know why? Because they were the light, and I was in darkness. But when you think about that, when you think about the light, we would think that light would blind sinners, and they would be welcome to the light, but that's not always the case. When I think about the light of the gospel, I think about the Word of God being a flashlight. And I'm not going to curve my Bible up like a flashlight, but I think about the Word of God being a flashlight. That when the gospel is going forth, it begins to shine light on the evilness and the wickedness of man. Y'all with me this evening? Mm -hmm. And the light of the gospel goes in to the hearts of man as a black light or an infrared light, whichever one you want to take, and shows man his imperfection. In other words, God uses the power of the word of God to expose man with the light of the gospel. But it's up to that man what he or woman, what he or she does with that. You would think that you were going to come to the light. But some people are like cockroaches. They want to run from the light. Speaking of which, I walked into an apartment today. I wish to God I wouldn't have. And somebody said, well, just reach up there on that counter and grab. And my germaphobe went into effect. And I was like, I do not want to touch this. Do you know why? There was light. And in that light, I could see all the filth. I could see everything that was around me, that was unsafe and unfair for me as a human. Now what if I'd have walked in there at night and there wouldn't have been any light and I had to get what I had to get? That would be a different story. I may know that it's not the cleanest of places, but it wouldn't have looked that bad to me. Tonight as a sinner, when the light of the gospel shines in, what you don't think is that bad, what you don't think is that corrupt, when the light hits it and exposes it for what it truly is, you realize that you're in worse shape than you ever dreamed of. You could be like Mike Riddle and not know it to get this worse. <laughs> All right? When you think about that, the light is still shining. <laughs> And tonight, when I think about the light shining, have we received that light from God? Are we walking in all of the light that God has given to us? The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and what church? A light unto my path. What does that light to that path do? It keeps us stay on track and stay in the center of the will of God. How do we do that? By having a relationship with the light. That light being Christ. Are we good on that tonight? If we are, say amen. amen. All right. Not only do we see him this evening as the light, not only do we see him as the word, but tonight, thirdly, I want us to look at him as the son of God. Go with me this evening to verse number 15. Verse number 15 tonight. Can you find your place in verse 15? Say amen. amen. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. Notice this. He goes back and repeats. But grace and truth came by how, church? Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. Verse number 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he, excuse me, he hath declared him. Tonight when I see him listed as the Son of God, Jesus is mentioned at least 89 times in the book of John. John had the special privilege of introducing Jesus to the nation of Israel. He also had the difficult task of preparing the nation to receive their Messiah. He called them to repent of their sins and to prove that repentance by being baptized and then the life, life uh, and then living changed life. We know that repentance is more than being baptized. I mistyped that in my notes, all right? Verse number 15 through 17, we see Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He has the fullness of grace and truth. Tonight when we look at that, verse number uh, 16, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Did we not deal the other Wednesday night about where sin did abound, grace did much more abound? When we think about that tonight, we think about grace being greater than all of our sin. Verse number 17, for the law was given by Moses. Again, the Old Testament talks about the law. And what the law, again, we reference the law again. We see what the law is all about. The law was given in Exodus chapter number 20, right? When Moses was up on the mount, pinning down the law, he came down and seen Aaron and the people of God building a golden calf. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, because when Moses asked Aaron, where did this calf from? Well, Lord, well Moses, it just appeared. Is that what he said? Well, how did it just appear, Aaron? Everybody's missing their earrings. Everybody's missing their jewelry. Everybody's missing all their gold. But it just appeared. Have you thought about that? Think about it. Moses gave the law. Moses got mad, threw down the tablets, and broke the law. Had to go back and write it again. Now think about this. How long did it take him to sit up there and catch all that? Took him a while. Took back and had to write it again. I wouldn't want to do that, would you? Carve it. I get mad when I have to type something again. Much less sitting up there carving it in the snow. Man. But the law was given by Moses. But notice this. Grace and truth came out by Jesus Christ. When the law would say, condemn death, Grace said, hold up. I can forgive and forget. Y'all with me this evening? Grace was revealed to David. When David sinned, by the law, David should have died. But why didn't he? The grace of God. Moses, when he killed the Egyptian, by the law, Moses should have died. Why didn't he? The grace of God. Y'all with me this evening? Am I helping us? So the law says you're guilty of your sin. The law says you must pay the consequence for your sin. But grace steps in and says, no, I've made a full pardon for the sin. And truth says you don't need to do this anymore. Truth says you're forgiven. You're set free. Go and sin no more. Amen. We only see these fullness of grace and truth. Verse number 18. We see that him by Jesus Christ being the son of God. He reveals God to us. As to his essence we know that God is invisible. But man can see God revealed in nature. We notice that in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 20. Right? Y'all remember that? In his mighty works in history. But he cannot see God himself. Jesus Christ reveals God to us, for he is the image of the invisible God. And he is the express image of his person. 
He came and declared. That word declared there means to explain, to unfold, to lead the way. I'm grateful for that tonight in God. That makes it more than a baby just lying in a manger, doesn't it? Sure does. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ explains God to us and interprets him for us. We simply cannot understand God apart from knowing his son, Jesus Christ. The word son is used for the first time in John's gospel as a title for Jesus Christ. The phrase only begotten means unique, the only one of its kind. Why is he the only one of its kind? Because he was the seed planted in a virgin's womb by the hand of God. He is the only one who could come and live perfectly in an imperfect world. Who was it the other week talking about Mary and Joseph? I think it was Mike in Sunday school class. And he said, could you imagine being Joseph and having the father, Jesus, being perfect? Somebody made the statement one time, and I can't remember who it was. Could you imagine being a brother to Jesus and your mama saying, act like Jesus does for once. <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine that? They get in trouble. Why'd you get in that fight? Jesus didn't get in a fight. You got in the middle of one. That's like he does forever now. Like, well, I thought you were perfectly perfect. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be in a lose-lose situation. But when you think about that this evening, it means he's unique. It does not suggest that there was a time when the son was not. And then the father brought him into being. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He has always existed. And we know of nine different times in John's gospel he's called the Son of God. When you think about reading that through all the gospels, that, that caught my eye last night when I was doing some studying. Putting the final notes together and the reference was made, this is in John's gospel, it's the first place that he's called the Son of God. And then John went as far in 3.16 saying he was the only begotten. That word's unique. Man, that never clicked. And then I went back and started researching the gospel. He's right. Nowhere else do you see him referred to as the Son of God. Think about that. Lastly, this evening, and I'm done. Not only do we see him as the Son of God. Everybody good? If we're good, say amen. amen. All right. Lastly, this evening, I not only see him as the Son, but lastly, I see him as the Lamb. When we see him as the lamb, go with me to verse number 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse number 35, and again, the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. When we think about that, we see that it was the second day of the week that the Apostle John recorded, and no doubt some of the same committee members were present to hear John the Baptist's message. This time he called Jesus the Lamb of God, a title that he would repeat the next day. If we go back to Genesis chapter number 22 and verse number 7, the first reference to about the Lamb being mentioned is when Abraham's taken Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him. And Isaac said, Father, we have the wood, we have the altar, we have everything that we need, but where is the lamb? Now that was a question that Abraham did not want to have to answer. Because Abraham knew in the back of his mind that his son was to be the sacrifice. Go with me this evening. When we think about that, Jesus, God knew that when he sent his son into the image of man, that he would be the lamb, the supreme sacrifice for all men. In one sense, the message of the Bible can be summed up in the title, God being the lamb of God. 
The question in the Old Testament was, where is the Lamb? In the four Gospels, the emphasis, behold the Lamb of God. Here he is. After you have trusted him, in Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 12, the, we will be able to declare, worthy is the Lamb. Why? Because we know that he has been the sacrifice for our sins. And he is the reason that we have made it to heaven. One of the reasons that John recognized him as the lamb was because the people of Israel were familiar with lambs for the sacrifice. We know that at the Passover, each family had to have a lamb, right? During the year, two lambs a day were sacrificed at the temple altar, plus all the other lambs brought for personal sacrifices. Those lambs were brought by men to men. But now get a hold of this. But here is God's lamb given by God to men. Notice this. When the lambs were brought to the temple to be sacrificed, those lambs had to be examined for spots and blemishes, right? When the lamb, the supreme sacrifice of God, was sent to the world, he came as a perfect man. Who had not to be inspected. Y'all with me this evening? Those lambs could not take away the sin. But the Lamb of God can take away sin. Those lambs were for the Jews alone. But this lamb would shed his blood for the entire world. So tonight when we look at Jesus, we see him not only as the light, the Son of God, the Word, but tonight John almost concludes chapter number one with him being the Lamb of God. So tonight when you look at him, and I'm done with that, tonight when you look at him, and I could go on, I could preach for countless days on the different things that Jesus is. But tonight when we think about Christmas and you see him as the babe in a manger, I don't want you to just stop there, but I want you to think about who Jesus is to you and what he is to you and what he's done for you and how he's changed you and the different things, and maybe I didn't, and I know I didn't mention everything because I could get on to him about being the second coming Lord and how he's going to rule and reign the world, the second coming king and rule and reign the world, and we could be here for hours on that. But when we think about that tonight, he's not just a lamb, but he is the lamb. Yeah. The, sal the savior of all <coughs> men. I hope you enjoyed the lesson tonight on John's Gospel, chapter number one. Any questions, any comments, any concerns? Can I leave anything out? We good? We good? Say amen. 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 All right. We'll dismiss in a word of prayer. And uh, before we do, we won't have a business meeting this Sunday, but we'll have one next Sunday, a week from Sunday, to elect our officers. All right? So if you want to obtain an office, I think I mentioned this in November. If you want to obtain an office, let us know. We'll discuss it and go forward from there. All right? So at this time, we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. I'll ask Brother John Munson, if you will, close us out. <coughs>